QSO Today episode 387, Callum McCormick, M0MCX. My thanks to ICOM America for sponsoring the QSO Today podcast. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, amateur call sign for Zulu One Uniform Golf, where I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio, do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates through these in-depth interviews just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. Before we start today, I have just a few notes. I was interviewed last week by the Red Summit RF YouTube channel, hosted by Charlie NJ7V, my guest in episode 382 a few weeks back, and by Dan KC7MSU and Brian W7JET. If you want to catch it, there is a link at the top of this week's show notes page. Tickets for the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo coming March 12th and 13th UTC are now on sale at the Expo website. Click on the banner image in this week's show notes page to get to registration. Callum McCormick, M0MCX, is YouTube's DX commander and maker of a line of antennas of the same name. Callum says that he has the best business in the world, I believe him, and is an active ham on the air, always testing and fine-tuning his antenna creations. M0MCX shares his discoveries with antennas and ham radio on a regular YouTube postings, growing his audience to over 42,000 subscribers. Callum McCormick, M0MCX, is my QSO today. M0MCX, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Callum? Yes, I am, Eric. Hello. Callum, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Oh, interesting memories, Eric. Uh, my first recollection of that there was something uh, called radio. I went to a boarding school and we had something called a combined cadet force. Uh, and from the age of 13, you know, we dressed up as little soldiers and stuff. Uh, the, but the big boys, they had available to them um, a little radio room with a long wire antenna. And that's what they called it, a long wire. I have no idea what they did. I was far too naughty as a child <laughs> to get involved in that. But that's the first inkling I, I, I had that actually radio was available to the average Joe. Uh, my father happened to be in the, in the army as well. He was a Royal Signalsman uh, for many years. And he tried to explain to me, I remember as a young boy, the ionosphere and how the low bands were different to the high bands, depending if it was night or day. Now, I'm sure he was trying his best, but I don't actually believe that he fully understood it either. What was the hometown? So I was brought up, although I was born in Scotland, I was brought up on the south coast of England, a little place called Torquay, which is, uh, is, it used to be the, the English Riviera, it was called, uh, which is not far from Brixham, a very large uh, fishing uh, town, almost a fishing village. Of course, a lot of these boats, of course, had um, VHF antennas and that sort of thing. But it wasn't until I was 18, Eric, that... Um, I hitchhiked to the south of France. I ended up getting a job, actually, on a millionaire's private yacht. And, uh, and I was there for a few months, all through the summer. And we had, we had a, a huge white antenna coming off the bridge. And this was the SSB uh, radio. And the captain would pick up what looked like an old-fashioned telephone handset, but it had a push-to-talk button inside, you know, where, you, you, where your fingers gripped. And right. he would press all these buttons and dials on this radio and he would make a call to a place called Porter's Head Radio. He would say, Porter's Head Radio, Porter's Head Radio, this is Gulf Victor, India Delta. And of course, we'd be in the middle of the Mediterranean somewhere and Porter's Head Radio would pick up what I would classify now as a five and nine copy. And uh, the captain would request to make a phone call and then the boss would come in, the guy who owned the boat, and he would phone his son or something, you know. I was astonished that this stuff existed. Tremendous. That was my first recollection. And I'm sorry, Eric, I forgot the question now, but that's my first inkling of what all this radio stuff was, which I thought was marvellous. We'll go back a little bit. So you went to a boarding school, 
probably like we would see in like Goodbye Mr. Chips. <laughs> it was. Uh, you wore uh, straw hats and you sang the school song in the morning. Yeah. But um, on the surface, the school looked just perfect and lovely. But underneath, I can tell you, it was like, it was like some sort of junior prison, I promise you. You didn't necessarily have an affinity for radio electronics as a kid. It wasn't until you were working on this yacht that you actually kind of saw the openings of potential new DX. That, that's right. Just, just the, the magic. I call it the magic of radio. And I discovered that. And then, of course... Being, so I'm 62 now, so as a young man, there was this thing called CB, Citizen Band Radio, which was taking the UK by storm. Now, I came at it, I believe, fairly late in the day, um, but I ended up with a little CB radio, which was uh, four watts, mostly AM, on 27 megahertz. And it was great. You know, you could chat to your friends around town and things like that. It was, it was hilarious fun. And that kind of satisfied me for a bit, uh, the magic of radio until I accidentally one day bumped into a guy on my four watts and he was in Texas in America. And, uh, and I realized then that, oh, there's more to radio than meets the eye. I thought it was just two miles up the road, but now I'm all of a sudden talking to a fella in Texas. And to be honest, Eric, I shelved the hobby fairly, fairly quickly after that and thought to myself, I've got to get my what we say in the UK, I've got to get my nose to the grindstone, get my career off the, off the ground, and I'm going to revisit this formally one day, and, and which is what I did years later. So let's talk a little bit about your career. I saw someplace that you say that you were a nanny to snowflakes. What did that mean exactly? <laughs> You've been reading my old LinkedIn profile. Well, as an older fellow in industry, I've, all my main businesses I've now got rid of. I only have got an antenna business now. But I, I was a nanny because <laughs> they would come in or not come in on a Monday morning. It depends if the football had been on on Saturday, Sunday, and their team had lost or won. And sometimes they just wouldn't turn up. I, I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't understand why. And These of course, are employees it's, of your business. Yeah, absolutely. And they just got drunk and they couldn't turn up the next morning. And, and, and frankly, I just got fed up with managing those those types of people now i know it's my own fault as a business owner i should have employed someone else but fundamentally when you employ young people that's what you end up with sometimes these are employees of your business yeah absolutely and they just got drunk and they couldn't turn up the next morning and and, and frankly i just got fed up with managing those those types of people now i know it's my own fault as a business owner i should have employed someone else but fundamentally when you employ young people that's what you end up with sometimes I've employed young people throughout my career. I guess you kind of have to figure out what it is that kind of drives them, right? You do. And what we're finding out, it's not money. Uh, no, it's not. Some of them it is. And, and fundamentally, I was in an industry where these guys would actually have to work very hard for the money. I mean, there was really no way out of it, you know. So, but anyway, I mean, I've moved on from there. Callum, what kind of industries have you been in? I mean, we'll talk a bit about the current business, but what kind of businesses were you in? Yeah, so I cut my teeth as a, a sort of what they call a commercial salesman, in, in a technical commercial salesman. So that was working for a company, and we sold, they made, and I was the representative, uh, analog panel meters and control knobs. Now, to be honest, I actually found that job quite exciting because when you're sitting in front of a design engineer, who has typically, you know, like a 19-inch front panel, and it might be three or four U's high. And I would have in my sample case, you know, the sort of blanks, you know, control knob blanks and uh, panel meter blanks. And he would lay it out on, on the deck. He said, oh, you know, sometimes he would talk about the guts of the machine. And it, this, these would be big companies, so Ray Cal, Plessy, GC, Marconi, whatever. And that was quite in interesting. And I learned... I didn't realize how much I was learning sitting with design engineers talking about their product. But you end up, <laughs> I suppose, looking, <laughs> you're the, one of the few people that have kind of got to the bottom of this with me, Eric. But, you know, they'd show me the back of the machine, you know, and there would be BNCs and PL259s and N-types and banana plugs. And so by osmosis, I just kind of gradually got to understand 
what design engineers were thinking, you know, the difference between a toroidal transformer and a, and a you know, a, a, a different type of transformer and the weights and the panel sizes and everything. And I actually think that's given me a, a, a nice hmm, sort of engineering uh, sympathy towards how some things are made. Yeah, that was that was very nice. But that was that was a technical sales uh, representative job. You know, and they, I had a little car and I drove around the countryside and visited all these companies. It was very nice. I actually remember doing something very similar for a test equipment company, a field salesperson. And that was a very interesting business. The interesting thing about analog panel meters is that they're still used quite a lot now. Yeah. It's not like something that's disappeared. I guess maybe now they remote monitoring a lot of devices. But having the panel meters makes you seem like it's really working, right? That's it. Beautiful device. And they were made, it was apparently, well, my father was the, uh, w was one of the executives, actually. And uh, so I remember the, the, the firm from, from a very young age. But they were eff effectively watch movements, you know, with a couple of jewels and springs and all sorts of things. Beautifully made, mostly by ladies, because they got the finer hands and more delicate and so on. But of course, you know, you've got all the other, you know, injection molding and silk screening and because they made everything. It's fantastic. It sounds like a great business. Now, you've done some other things as well in your career. Well, as a young man, I, I needed money to be able to do things because, um, you know, I, I lived away from home and I had my own world. Um, so I got to, you know, I got into all sorts. Um, an interesting uh, job was actually uh, I, I managed to get a product uh, to sell, which was a graph plotter. And that... Um, you know, picked up a pen and drew a circle and, you know, and, and made drawings, right. you know, straight off out of the back of AutoCAD, things like that, which is a you know, two or three D drawing program. So I did that for a while. And then I ended up moving into laser printers. And then I did IT recruitment for about 30 years. Uh, and IT recruitment in a way was quite nice for a long period of time because it allowed me to talk technical things. I wasn't so comfortable, you know, talking about money and what colour car he wanted and all this sort of stuff. But I could always revert back to technical because there were programmers and engineers and that sort of thing. And I could find, I suppose, uh, a little parallel universe where both of us uh, infested. And, and I could, I could uh, you know, get to understand someone from a technical perspective. And, and drawing on my years of sitting in front of design engineers, I just found it quite natural. So that's why I quite enjoyed IT recruitment. Ah, there's another side of IT recruitment, which is dog eat dog, and which isn't so pleasant, to be honest. And one of the reasons I, when DX Commander came along, which is my company now, I thought, you know what, I've had enough of all this. Let's just bin it. Just be an entrepreneur instead of... Well, I guess being an IT recruiter is also being an entrepreneur. All of these things that you're doing, if you're running it yourself, you're being entrepreneurial. Yeah, it was always a family business. So I've had my own business since I was about 40, I suppose. I was the reluctant uh, entrepreneur, I actually thought. Don't you think we're all reluctant entrepreneurs? Yes. I thought it was going to be a lot easier, right? The idea of eating is very appealing to a lot of people. <laughs> it is. But to be honest... I mean, they say, don't they, that if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And I thought, well, I'm just one of the everybody's. This is going to be easy. But the challenges of actually running your own business are, you know, we've heard of the swan sitting on the lake, you know, and the, you've got the feet paddling underneath. Well, I, I'm more like a whole, half my family is like a whole flock of swans, I'm telling you. <laughs> There's a lot of current going on underneath, yeah. Oh, I bet. One other thing is you also do voiceover recordings for people? I have done. But not anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm too busy with my own recording, you know, doing stuff for YouTube these days. You know, I had an inquiry today for a guy who wants a video and all sorts of things. I, I'm just, I, I prefer to give my time to people for free and just for the fun of it um, because I'm just busy anyway. You know, I don't really want to make money out of a voiceover or helping someone do a video or whatever. I just help them out for the hell of it, you know. And now this message from ICOM America. Now is the time to spice up your ham shack with ICOM's new ID52A handheld portable radio. Now shipping. This radio is perfect for staying in or venturing out and working your favorite VHF and UHF bands this winter season. 
Did I say that the ICOM ID52A is now shipping? ICOM's newest handheld radio is a VHF-UHF dual bander with D-Star and FM dual mode functions. This radio supports conventional FM communications and D-Star simplex, repeater, regional, and worldwide calls over the D-Star Internet Gateway. The ICOM ID52A is the first handheld amateur radio with a full-color 2.3-inch waterfall display and the ability to send photos over D-Star with a connected Android device. Other ID52A features include a wideband receiver with guaranteed range of 144 to 148 MHz and 440 to 450 MHz. It supports VV, UU, VU, and dual DV mode. It has an integrated GPS GLONASS receiver, including grid square locations. Other features include micro SD card slot, micro USB for data transfer and programming and charging, and of course it is IPX7 waterproof in case you drop it. Be sure to check out the new ICOM ID52A at your nearest ham radio dealer along with a full line of amazing ICOM radios. And when you make that ICOM purchase, be sure to tell your dealer that you heard about it here on QSO Today. One more note, if you are visiting the 2022 Orlando Hamcation from February 11th to February 13th, be sure to find ICOM's booth to see the ID52A up close and personal. And now back to our QSO today. I was intrigued by, you say that you do children's stories on voiceovers, and I was trying to think, God, that's got to be interesting. Yeah. I have published a couple of those on YouTube, actually, just for fun, you know. I would think the kids would love your voice. Yeah. I initially recorded them for my son. And gosh, I don't know where you dug that up from, Eric. You've really been crawling around the internet. I think it's on your website, actually. Oh, yeah, that's fine then. So I've got Hans Anderson's Fairy Tales here, and it's about three projects down. I keep meaning to do another one, but I'm just, I overcommit. And I don't know whether a lot of people in the technical world are like this, but I mean, at 62, I've just been diagnosed as having, as being autistic. I can't do anything about it. But you don't sound like a person who's autistic. No, I'm not severely autistic, but I have a lot of traits of, of autisticness, if that's the right word. So uh, it's very easy for me to overcommit to things and then forget. Uh, that's one of my, my problems because I've also been diagnosed with something called ADHD as well. Yes, I understand both those things, but my wife would attribute your condition to just being male. Oh, really? <laughs> overcommit and forget. Yes, that's the story of my life. I hear this all the time. Eric, you've overcommitted, but you forgot. I have to use a lot of techniques now. I understand completely what you're going through. From personal experience, maybe we overcompensate with technology to try to keep up with the world as it hurls at us, item by item. What do you think? Are you a technology user? Obviously, we're talking on technology, but do you have all kinds of calendars and reminders and things like that that you keep going? I have one system, which is my email calendar. And if I book anything, I now know that even if it's tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I have to put in the calendar and then I put a reminder an hour before, you know. And if it's uh, something like a, a doing a podcast with Eric, what I have to do is put it in for two weeks ahead and then put the reminder at one week and then put a reminder at three days, you know. So I, I can't, that way I can't lose anything. If I don't put it in the diary, don't put a reminder, it will go. Yeah, it's amazing, Callum, that we have this stuff. I don't know how I was doing this before. I think I had a leather binder called Daytimer or something like that that, kind of did that in paper but that was pre-computer that's right i used to run an a4 book just with lines a4 being a letter size okay that's the european page size europe standard yeah and i would uh, write in it everything that happened today everything i had to do tomorrow and then if there was any appointments i'd carry them forward it wouldn't be a diary i would just have this endless moving wave of stuff i couldn't forget and that worked very well Absolutely. Yeah, I actually had a mentor that did the same thing with a loose leaf binder, and that's how he did it, and he did it very well. Let's go back to amateur radio. When did you get your first license? What was the thing that said, I'm going to go get licensed and get on the air? So uh, a couple of years after starting my business, I'm just cruising the internet one day, and I, I, it, just, it just dawned on me that I'd promised myself to look into this when I was a bit older, and the children were, you know, 
not babies anymore and we had an extra you know couple of hundred bucks coming in the house and i thought maybe i'll have a look at it now what i didn't realize is that in you know that 30 year 40 year gap the world had changed so um like in the in the us you know there's the tech license in the uk we have the foundation license in australia there's the foundation license which you know you just answer 26 extremely basic questions and they let you go on the air at low power you know with reduced privileges or whatever so i did that i think it was 2003 um, and then I discovered that um, to progress, I would have to do another one called the intermediate license, which I think is the equivalent of something like a general in the USA. And uh, but the last ever what they call in the UK, going back to 2003, for the last ever radio amateurs exam run by um, the city and guilds. Um, it was going to be an exam, I don't know, in about six months' time, and it was going to be the last one ever, and then it was all going to be dumped, and then you'd, you'd have to go down this very rigorous route of doing your foundation intermediate and full. So um, I thought, well, I'll just study hard and buy the books and have, and it's one of the reasons I think I'm successful now, is I had a very, very clear goal in my mind what I wanted to achieve, which was a you know, the full or advanced, whatever you want to call it, license, you know, the big ticket. And in those, or well, in 2022, they're currently issuing um, uh, those call signs of M0. And I wanted an M0 call. And uh, so I remember going on holiday for two weeks with Wendy and the children. I bought four books with me and it was all test papers. I remember having a pencil and answering all these uh, questions all the time. Then going back and studying, it must have been 100 exams I did, and then studying all the questions and all the answers and trying to work out why I got it wrong because they wouldn't be the same questions and answers. They would be slightly different. So then from there, I just worked out what the maths would be myself. Okay, I divide that by that and get this. Okay, so I could, I could transpose that question to be any other question and I would be able to get the right answer. And there we are. And I think I got, I don't know, 86% or something, which is quite a high score. But I was never taught, Eric, anything about electronics. I, I just self-motivated uh, myself to pass that exam. Um, and I would say the black, the, the dark area of my expertise in, when it comes to my hobby and my business is the circuit board. What's happening with all those capacitors and resistors and diodes? Because that's the bit I've, I've, I've failed at. But I have to say to people that we can't be an expert at everything. I mean, I'm a practical engineer. I make antennas and stuff like that. It would be difficult for me to be a very practical engineer on the one hand and be an electronics guy on the other, maybe. But sometimes we just bend to what, um, you know, what our skill set is. And I'm attracted to drilling holes in bits of metal and, and stringing up bits of wire and seeing if I can get them to resonate, Eric. Well, I think that that's maybe the foundation of amateur radio is that we try things that we've heard in theory are true, and then we do it and we see that, well, maybe it doesn't work the way we thought it was going to work, but then we massage it a little bit and it starts to work the way it's supposed to work, and that's how we learn. Yeah. I always thought that was kind of the way that ham radio worked for me. That's the ultimate. It's the ultimate learning experience is one of the reasons I absolutely love amateur radio is that. 99% of the time is all about unreeling a roll of wire, understanding how to prop a little mast thing up in the backyard or the back garden or whatever else, understanding what the coax loss is going to be or balance feed or what is that. It's the whole thing. You spend 99% of the time engineering your station only to try it out for 1% and then go, okay. So I wonder if I can get this working on a different band now. What would I need to do? How does a coil work? How do I wind that coil? What plumbing tubes do I need? And then we get, you know, creative. And I was talking to Mike, M0MSN, this morning, uh, just about this. He, he's the same. He's into magnetic loops, for instance. And he loves the idea of understanding a magnetic loop, pushing the boundaries, and getting it all on. He said the very fact it works... That's the, the culmination, uh, is, is the end of the line. So he doesn't need to get on the radio in a funny sort of way. His license allows him to transmit and make these test transmissions, uh, but he doesn't necessarily need to chat to someone on the radio to, to prove it. 
Now, I I actually like the operating side of things as well, but I love the fact that you could, with a piece, a roll of wire, and, and actually, Eric, to be honest, I started with bits of wood. I didn't have aluminium and fiberglass. I went to the woodyard and bought a banister rail, 16-foot-long banister rail, and just literally screwed that to a, a fence post. And that was the, the beginning of my 40-metre dipole world, you know. Let's go there. You now have a company called DX Commander. You have a YouTube channel called DX Commander. Why DX Commander? Let's just go there first. Um, I had a fascination. I love naming things. I think in another world, I would have been a bit, about, bit of a marketer. So I take uh, sometimes a bit of both. So I might take um, a senior title in industry or a title in, in the military and then apply it with something else. <laughs> James, a friend of mine, M0YOM, he's written a really cool piece of software that plugs into the ACOM, originally ACOM 2000, but now the whole fleet of stuff, with a cable to your serial port. And you can run your, and because and originally it wasn't designed to have a software front end, but he used logic analyzers and all sorts of things to understand what this port was doing, right? And he, he wanted to know what to call it. And I, and I just came up with ACOM director. You see, I just think the word you know, ACOM director, you know, it could have been ACOM president or ACOM commander. So I wanted this antenna thing and I just wanted a simple name for it. And uh, so I thought well, I probably just watched a James Bond film. I think he was Commander Bond. I thought, well, Commander's quite nice. DX Commander. Yeah, that sounds good enough. And I had a little apprentice working for me at the time, and he rattled off my logo for me inside 10 minutes. And DX Commander was born. And then, uh, of course, I mean, and it, it's, it's pennies to register your, your firm at the company's house in the UK or incorporate it in, in the US, appoint an accountant just to make sure that all the paperwork's in order. And, and we were off and running about four years ago. Now, were you in a transition I mean, were you in another business that you'd closed or that you'd sold and needed something to do, and this is why you started DX Commander? I'm the accidental entrepreneur again. Uh, so on the one hand, I was the uh, the guy who never wanted a business and then I ended up, I was the guy who accidentally started another one. So uh, DX Commander, I mean, <laughs> maybe, Eric, I'll start from the beginning because it's quite, it's quite a cool story. Um, because I never thought, and none of us presumably ever think that we're going to invent something. Now, I don't like the word invent. I like the word discover because, you know, the laws of physics exist. You don't invent them. But what you do is you can discover just different ways of, of, uh, uh, of putting the boundaries up. So simple as it may seem, if you take a fan dipole and, and turn it 90 degrees, so you've just got one set of uh, vertical elements going up in the air, that's how it happened. Basically, I had a 40-meter element near the beach in Cornwall on holiday, and I just wondered what the hell would happen if I strung a 20-meter element up the other side of this fiberglass pole. Now, I didn't get a perfect tune, but it gave me enough um, inspiration to think, actually, I'll bet you this probably would work. And now we put six elements up a fiberglass pole. There we go. Um, so uh, I just handmade, I think, 20 of these things. Um, I mean, it was very rudimentary th stuff. I mean, it was, you know... I got second-hand military telephone wire. I mean, the whole thing was just uh, put together on, on a shoestring for fun, almost. So what would happen in the mornings, I'd go to the main business with Wendy, you know. Then about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'd be, I'd be sort of itching to get away to my little workshop, which I I'd hired on, on this farm. And uh, I had to sort of wait for Wendy to let me go, you know. So I would shoot off to the, to the farm maybe reel off some more wire or drill out some holes with my little drill press thing because I had orders to fulfill and Wendy just thought it was a complete distraction and uh, well it was because it wasn't making any real money but I had people who wanted to buy these things and it's only fair that I ship them my little kit so uh, it went on and on until I got more and more uh, the family, if you, I'm, I may be the, don't tell Wendy I'm the head of the family, but you know what I mean, as the head of the business and everything else, I still need kind of permission that it's okay to go and do this other thing because I've got this real business with, with other humans and employees and problems of itself. So what we did is I have effectively trained Wendy to be the kind of managing director 
so I could go and play DX Commander. And we did an experiment for a year. Uh, I think that would have been 90, uh, 90, 20, uh, 2020. Uh, and at the end of the year, um, I proved that it could work. And uh, we agreed basically to, to shut the, the old business so I could put, because you know, we're all getting older and you only lived the once and all that sort of thing. And I just wanted uh, to be able to finish my working life off doing something that I enjoyed doing, not something that I had to do. Um, and that's uh, dear Scott. And since then, we've moved. We've got bigger premises now and we've got new products in the line. I've got a, a, a commercial antenna field. It's, I actually hire to do my r and D. I mean, I've got the best job in the world. Uh, hey, in a nutshell, um, Eric, that's, that's where I am now. I've looked at some of your videos. Now, you're prolific on your YouTube channel, and I think as of today, you've got over 41,000 subscribers on your YouTube channel. That's pretty admirable, actually. That's a good-sized audience. If they're subscribers, every time you publish, it goes bing, and people know about it. So I think that's really cool. In looking at your videos, I see that you've really, and this is kind of where I'm going in terms of the questioning, you've kind of become a master of tools. I'm impressed with the aluminum that you're cutting and drilling and putting at the base of the antenna and this white Teflon-like plastic that goes up the fiberglass poles, for example. Were those all skills that you acquired in the process of kind of building your first antennas? Or did you actually have this knack for building and using tools and fabricating stuff before you started DX Commander? A good question. So, um, no, the whole thing was a learning experience. The only thing I'd had experience of is, is basically using a spanner and a screwdriver to take a motorcycle apart once as, as a hobby. So... When DX Commander came along, I mean, I literally didn't know one piece of aluminium in the next, or I, 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 nothing about material science, plastics, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, the difference between that and PTFE, the different weights and how to, you know, measure aluminium and the, the length, sizes, widths, how to cut it, how it finish it. It's been an enormous uh, learning curve. I was inspired in a weird way that Mr. Honda from the Honda, you know, motorcycle, car, automotive business, didn't, didn't, I don't believe, started, he had sold his first motorcycle until he was 48 years old. So I thought, well, if he can do that, maybe at 60, I, <laughs> I could do something as well. All I'd do is I'd phone up, um, you know, a laser cutting company or a water jet business, and I'd just, I'd speak to the salespeople, and, and then if necessary, I would get through to their product guy, you know, and I'd just keep asking questions until I was, I was niche in a tiny area, you know. I didn't need to know everything about aluminium. I just needed to know about alum, aluminium plate, ideally, you know, three millimeters thick and that sort of thing, how it cuts, why it cuts it, what residue does it leave, does it need to be finished, you know, this whole thing. You know, I made some, some bizarre mistakes as well. For instance, I ordered... Uh, you know, hundreds of pounds, thousands maybe, of all my plates in black. But it turns out that they caught fire if anybody ever used a linear amplifier on some of these digital modes like, I don't know, FT8 or Ritty. So that was, well, I, at the time it wasn't funny. But um, so I, I, the only right thing to do is I put a recall notice out, wrote to everybody and, and gave them all the sort of clear, you know, without the carbon content effectively. So, and I've learned all the time. I mean, I, I'm nearly at the end of my learning with my current product range. So we take aluminium bits now. And what we do is I give them to this company that puts them in this, it looks like a massive washing machine. And in fact, they tumble them with pebbles and nylon beads and all sorts. And you end up with this lovely kind of matte finish so nobody can cut their finger on the edge, that sort of thing. I saw your antenna test range. You're out there with a shovel, digging a hole, planting the pipe. It sounds great. Now, do you have a cameraman that's actually following you around doing this? For a while, Lockie, my son, would, would do quite a lot of the filming. But now what I do is um, I just I have a tiny little camera on a tripod and I have a chair in the antenna field if I'm doing location work. And I just sit the antenna on a chair to film what I'm doing or I pick it up because I'm busy and I'm walking somewhere and I'll just chat to the camera. So, but um, if you see the camera ever moving when I'm in shot, then yeah, that will be my son just picking up, following me around. 
Now, when did you start the YouTube channel? So the channel itself is just over four years old. That predates the company. Well, no, because we had the brand. We registered the brand. It was just trading under my name from the tax perspective for for about 18 months. And then I thought if something went wrong and somebody wanted to sue me, they'll end up suing me personally. So I wanted to take me out of the equation and leave an incorporated business that they could sue that. <laughs> I'll, protect the, I'll protect the family. Honestly, that's the reason I did it. But the reason for the, originally the YouTube channel was going to, it was such a weird concept that I had just created in, in designed, not invented, designed. And I put these adverts on eBay, HF multiband vertical, you know, and I'm thinking, where do I start to explain what this is? Because I didn't really have a competitor out there. It wasn't a trapped dipole, that sort of thing. So I said, go and watch this, this video on the YouTube channel, you know. And of course, initially, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know there was people leaving comments on the YouTube channel for me to read. Well, why would they? Yeah, exactly. And after the first two or three of these sort of explaining videos, and I go back to them now and they're awful, you know. Yeah, they've got like 100,000 views. But I, anyway, um, and I just, and then I started to enjoy the art process of thinking up a, you know, a subject, getting any props I needed to do. And, you know, we've all got some skills. One of my skills was, uh, well, I call it antenna modeling, but it, but it is. I mean, I really enjoy just uh, drawing a few lines as if they were real bits of wire, you know, in a field and applying the maths on antenna modeling and just see roughly what it would do, you know. So I thought, well, that's quite an interesting thing to do. And it's really taught me quite a lot of things. So on the YouTube channel, I used to do quite a lot of this antenna modeling, just showing people the basics, you know. And uh, and it went from there. And then I started to realize that there was a thousand people watching me, you know, every week, whatever it was. Uh, and, and then the process became, I understood the process better. And then I realized that actually I could do the company and the YouTube channel were actually were, were as a one. You know, they, they, they were together. You can't separate the two out. So, you know, that's when we moved uh, at the end of last year, ooh, year before, the end of 2020. So all, all 21 was refurbing and putting the antenna field on and pulling cables through and putting shelves up and building all the kitchen cabinets that became Wendy's countertop to do a counting out 17 washers and six of these. And, um, and in fact, Eric, what is amazing is that we hadn't budgeted to move. We were kind of forced into a move and... I, I reckoned it was going to cost us about 15000 and I just committed to another, I don't know, 1500 or 2000 telescopic poles. And I was wondering where all the money was coming from, and I shared that on a blog post, whatever you want to call it, on YouTube, and opened up a GoFundMe page, and we raised all the money we needed to raise uh, for, the, for the move and the refurb. So most of last year, certainly the first six months, all the videos were showing people where their money had gone, really, where the, you know what I'd bought and where the shelves were going and what my desk looked like and that sort of thing. So my 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 channel kind of slowed down a little bit because of um, it wasn't traditional ham radio stuff. It was you know me cutting up bits of wood and screwing things to the wall. I want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KJ6VU, and now joined by Rod, VA3ON, Mike, VA3MW, Mark, N6MTS, and Vince, VE6LK. Every two weeks, George and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests' workbenches. This group is project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building, or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. Well, I actually came across your channel last year when I was trying to think about, was there some way for me to improve the area that I'm working in right now for 
making a better podcast or making, you know, maybe eventually doing video. And I came across one of your videos where you're actually laying out and trying to figure out how to make your studio, the studio that you're in right now, talking to me. I thought that was really interesting. The whole process, you're thinking about how it should be. That was really cool. It didn't occur to me at the time that you were a ham. Oh, really? I don't know why. Maybe I just saw one video. I Maybe I didn't go to the whole channel itself. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But you were able to, with your community, able to actually get yourself transitioned. I actually saw the GoFundMe page as well. And I actually saw the comments that people wrote who were quite supportive of what you were doing and that you would continue to provide them with the information and entertainment on your YouTube channel. Yeah, it was quite a humbling experience, actually. Um, and and it's, a, it's amazing. When we, as individuals, do a lot of contribution, I wasn't used to getting any payback ever. You know, I've done, Wendy did um, you know, girl guiding, brownies and girl, uh, girl scouts, effectively. I was a group scout leader, um, you know, running, I don't know, 300 children. That's, that's 600 parents, by the way. It's a lot of people. The, the kids were the easy ones. And... Yeah. Um, because the day I just couldn't cope anymore and I left there. Um, you know, you, you, you're just switched off. You know, you're no longer on the, on the distribution lists. Nobody wants to know. You've gone, right? I mean, it takes about 12 minutes to leave. You know, it's gone and you never knew you were there. And you drive past the scout building and your name's gone. You know, I mean, it's just quite remarkable. So when we were moving, and I said, I've got this little problem, I was expecting I might be lucky to raise a couple of thousand pounds it just maybe to pay the deposit for the rent even. Um, I, I'm just not used to the fact that every, every, so many people gave me tens and twenties. Oh, there was, hell, Eric, there was people giving me $200, 200 pounds, um, and just saying it, it was worth it for them. I mean, I actually, to this day, I'm not quite sure how to respond, to be honest. Apart from occasionally mention it to people like I'm doing now. I think just being grateful for it is enough. I'm grateful for my supporters that support the podcast because it's a labor of love. And I think that comes through on your channel when you're talking about whatever you're talking about or the cameras following you around the shop. I was intrigued with a VHF antenna that you were kind of restoring and putting on this hydraulic pedestal that you've got out in the side of the building. You demonstrate like a real love for just taking it apart, cleaning it up, getting it to work, making a mistake, wrong connector, redoing it, you know, trying to get it through the hole in the house without having to pull everything apart. I think that comes through. This is genuine and that you love what you're doing. And I think that that's what comes through on the video. Uh, to this day, I mean, I suppose in a funny sort of way, if I actually knew what RF was, if I could really understand it, the magic would be ruined for me in a funny sort of way. I remember watching a very old, somebody put it on YouTube, very old. This is before widescreen. So this is four by three old TV. It was a BBC producer and it was before some program was about to be recorded. But the cameraman's there with his recorder and you've got the producer telling this professor that the camera's about to start, he'll come out and he wants to explain to the audience what radio is okay and this professor starts scratching his head and going why on earth would anybody want to know what that is he said and even if i could tell them it would take me at least an hour <laughs> so knowing that the magic of radio i like just to keep it magic although i must admit i did once say on one of my youtube videos that RF is a little bit like magic. But then a very serious man came along and said, I don't think it helps anybody for you to tell people that radio is magic. I don't believe for, of course, a split second that anybody actually believes it really is magic, but there's an element of magic behind it. Oh, I think that's really true. I'm over 60. You just mentioned at the beginning that you're 62. I think that any of us that grew up in the 60s or even grew up even before then, and most of the people I interview on the QSO Today podcast are older, like we are. We remember a time when to be in communication with anybody in the street, we could start in the street, but in the street, in the field, in the country, was impossible unless there was a, a wireline telephone there. And even though I know how it all works now. I mean, after all these years and being involved in the two-way radio industry and telecommunications, 
it's still magic. The fact that you can take your phone and it works in the middle of the desert where there's nothing but rattlesnakes and scorpions, it's magic. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's nothing better than actually going out to a field, you know, with a car battery and a radio and a bit of wire and actually talking to someone on another continent. That, that, that's truly marvellous, isn't it? I mean, it just is. And the, the trouble is, with the modern global infrastructure we've got, we're spoilt now for, for comms. But I think we have to look at it in a different way. It's the fun of it. It's the fun of the science of doing it without the global infrastructure. I see with the kids in the neighborhood when they come, they'll come down my stairs and they'll see all the ham radio equipment and they'll ask about it and they'll say, well, what can you do with that? And you say, well, see that wire there that I can talk around the world with that wire. And they go, really? Well, I don't need a wire on my phone. I said, yes, but you need a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure that connects you to even to calling someone across the street. That's right. It is magic and it does do something different. What kind of project do you have on the bench right now that you think is new or different for you? Is there some new technology that you're exploring that you kind of want to master in the next year? Um, well, apart from um, taking my original product and making it better, no. I have uh, some heavier fiberglass poles. We call it the signature range. Um, in fact, I was going to start that today, but it'll be tomorrow now. Um, and and I, I'm fascinated in... Um, how to get 80 meter the 80 meter band in a slightly more compact form because to get really nice dx a vertical antenna for your transmit is, is really nice and um and i've done that with a 60 foot or 18 meter whatever it is pole i mean it's pretty unwieldy and for someone the first time user of a telescopic pole 58 feet or whatever it is 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 enormous right? it really is quite substantial so it's not a first-time user, but I've got a 12.4 meter, about half the weight, maybe about, yeah, about half the weight. It's still pretty substantial. So tomorrow I'm going to get, um, I've, I've got some prototype odds and ends, aluminium and plastics and stuff. And I'm going to try and get uh, all, well, I'm going to start the project of getting 80 meters in, inside, squash it inside 12.4 meters, while it will still handle high power and will as a minimum, cross the Atlantic at night, you know, on 80, plus all the other bands. So that's, I quite look forward, to, I like quite look forward to that because when people buy my kit, they get support as well. Excuse me. They have to get the support as well. So that will mean, you know, they'll want you know, element lengths, how many radials and all that sort of stuff. So it's not just getting it to work for me. It's getting it to work for me so I can take it down, put it back in a different part of the, part of the field, install it all again and it will still work and i can measure all the elements and then i've got to write the user guide then i've got to go out to more of my suppliers and get the best prices and uh, and put a kit together we've got to get the packaging you know it's it's quite an interesting job <laughs> getting it all so and talk to fedex you know how big do you want the box Ooh. so we've already done that about a year ago actually so these these are coming in uh, they're on the boats right now they're about a half an inch short than i really wanted but it's it's to get inside the box and so fedex won't charge me another 40 dollars whatever it is so that'll be fun that's really fun and also we're trying to make it self-supporting so you won't need any guy wires it's quite, it's quite 12.4 meters is pretty pretty tall that's 40 feet and the wind might take it down although i'm assuming that you must have wind there we have wind there the, the, the thing is about wind it takes trees down takes roofs off and occasionally it takes antennas down so, yeah, that's one of those things. If, if you've got a storm coming, and you could either drop it down or put some guy wires on it. What modeling software, antenna modeling software, do you use? Well, I currently, because I'm just very quick with it, I use MMANA. But um, a couple of my subscribers and close friends have used other software as well. So if I'm concerned about a particular model, I'll ask them, can you run it through your thing? And then we compare all three and make sure, on average, we're getting the same result. So that'll do. But in the main, the modeling software is kind of to prove to people in mathematically this thing is going to work. But the, as we say in the UK, the proof of the pudding is, in fact, and one of the reasons I live stream at least once a week of me actually on a radio, sometimes with 10 watts, sometimes with 100 watts is they can go, oh, I could do that as well. Yes, you can. So 
I think sometimes we've lost the art of calling CQ. Now, I'm an SSB guy, as it so happens, although I've got on my hit list this year, I've got to start my CW. Um, but I'm an SSB guy, so calling CQ, sometimes I don't want to because I can't be bothered. I just want to twiddle the dial and have a little play with my radio. But I think <laughs> I'm one of these uh, guys, Eric, if I hear someone calling CQ, I'm one of those mugs. I've got to respond. I think how discourteous of I, I can't possibly listen to somebody endlessly calling CQ. I've got to give them a shot back. And hopefully when I call CQ, I, I get the same sort of response, you know. Yeah, I think there's a lot of us listening and not many of us replying oftentimes, it seems to me. Because I'll hear people sending CQ for a long period of time until someone answers. I think, uh, I can't remember who said it now. And somebody said, you need to call CQ like your life depends on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> there are some people who can call CQ and it's like, yeah, okay, it's like, just like a bit of poetry going off. But if, if they were calling CQ and you thought, hang on a minute, are they in a sinking ship or something? <laughs> you might give them a call back. Now, I'm quite enthusiastic when I call CQ. I just think it's quite important. It's not so much I'm putting a show on. But I just want them to feel comfortable that they're in the right hands if they respond. Do you know what I mean? One of the th videos that intrigued me, it was called Easy Way of Visualizing Your Antenna with a Balloon. And I loved where you put a puff of air into the balloon and said, this is the power. And you were working with a round balloon showing how an isotropic antenna works and what its radiation pattern looks like. And then you had a different balloon for a beam. And I, I thought... What an amazing way to visualize actually how antenna patterns work. And then, of course, you used your software to show that this was what you were doing. And I thought, you know, the visualization is what a lot of people need to actually understand what it is they're doing when they're playing with antennas. Yes, I think some people imagine that the antennas make more energy than there really is. And, and in fact, you've pointed out a very old video there. I've, I've actually got some balloons on my desk here that I've recently, <laughs> recently. Um, well, now we're using it for COVID testing. <laughs> and I'm about to remake that video effectively uh, with my own spin. It was, it's really to explain, I want to focus on DBs more than just antenna gain, but but I think some people imagine that their ant some, an antenna actually makes more energy than there really is, but you can only just push it around, you know, like a balloon. You know, you, just, you can squeeze a balloon. It won't get any bigger or, or smaller. It'll just go somewhere else, you know. So, yeah, that's, I love the visualization, I must admit. And I think to myself, is somewhat, people have tried to explain to me things, and after 20 minutes with my ADHD, I'm literally pulling my hair out. Just get on with it, you know, or, or le let me visualize the thing. I get sometimes very kind people sending me very long emails. <laughs> I can't, I can't read it. I just can't read it. I've occasionally printed it off and said to Wendy, could you read this and tell me if there's anything I need to do? So with that experience, I've decided in my videos to kind of either get to the point or be engaging so they can have a bit of fun with it. And the other thing, Eric, is that there's people who are very clever on, on my channel and on the internet, of course, doctors, professors, and all sorts of things. So if I can come up with a couple of ideas that they can use in their presentations, and well, I'm a winner. My accountant once said to me, why does your antenna have all these wires going up at different lengths? And, and I came up with another analogy, which I thought was really nice. I said, well, Gary, I said, ham radio, or well, the whole radio frequency uh, spectrum, is a bit like a grand piano, where the very long strings play the low notes and the very short strings play the higher notes. So because the amateur radio is split into various bands, very often harmonically related, what we can do is we can just take each of the octaves and place them into a, a nest of verticals. And there's all your different frequencies because they all want to resonate on their own little band. Are you a musician? I'm a drummer. But I was kind of classically trained in the school orchestra to, you know, count to 131 bars and then go ting on the, um, <laughs> on the triangle. You're a percussionist. Yes. I have a bass guitar and a six-string guitar on the wall here. And I still have, I've got, I'm a rock, I ended up a rock drummer. There we are. But I find ham radio more 
um, more reliable than working with other musicians, put it that way. Yeah, I think that's true. What's the current rig? Okay, my current favorite radio is something called a TS990S, TS990. It's, it's a big radio. It has two VFOs. And I'm one of the few people who regularly use both. So I have uh, my transmit um, normally on my left VFO, which is the main main one. And I have a receive antenna, which I can switch between two different receive loops on my right-hand VFO. And then I hit a button and track. So as I move my main VFO, the right-hand VFO moves with it. And it's a fascinating experience, if anybody has ever had a two-VFO radio, to be able to listen to a signal in stereo on your headphones and you will hear a signal at kind of two o'clock and then gradually it will drift up, you know, past three o'clock, four o'clock, and then it will come back to noon and go back to ten as it kind of drifts around the polarisation. The other marvellous thing I do with it is that if you're ever running a pile-up, you get all these call signs, not in mono, in the one place. But you get them all spaced out in like a like a grid right across just the audio spectrum, depending on the polarization that's coming in. So you can hear a little American guy. Well, not little. He's probably quite big. But you hear some American guy. And yesterday I was on the radio. The Whiskey 2 or the Whiskey 4 was was nearly on my left ear. But there was a Papa Alpha or Papa Delta nearly on my right ear. I could hear them both completely. Uh, the Papa Alpha guy. And I asked the whiskey guy to stand by, and I'll get to him in a minute. That's, that's a marvelous experience for anybody who's got a 2 BFO radio. Do you have other radios on your operating position besides the Kenwood TS-990? So um, I have an Acom 2000, which is a big, big amplifier. It's too big to lift these days uh, at my age. Uh, but it comes nicely with a little remote head, so just up by my monitor. And so that, that's my main, main station. Then I have a 12-volt world with uh, something called a, a TS-590 SG and a little 12-volt amplifier, actually. It does about 400 watts off two car batteries and a Victron charger power supply. That's, it's a really cool little thing. It delivers up to 30 amps on its own just as a power supply, but you can hook up the batteries. It knows it's got batteries hooked up and it keeps the batteries conditioned as well. So I could probably suck about 100 amps out of that if I needed to. And on voice peaks, it might well do, actually, on might certainly 70 amps when the amplifier is full going. We will return to our guests in just a moment. A new way to show your support of the QSO Today podcast is to buy me a coffee. I consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast. Invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button, buy me a coffee, on the QSO Today show notes page. And now back to our QSO today. You kind of answered a question that was brewing in the back of my mind, and that is that with DX Commander, you're building vertical antennas. Oftentimes, what I've learned about vertical antennas is that in an urban environment, they tend to be pretty noisy antennas because of the vertical polarization and the electronic noise that you might find you know, in the houses in the neighborhood. Then what you said is that you also use receive loop antennas, which I've always thought wouldn't that be actually the right combination is to have a multi-band vertical in the backyard but use magnetic loops or receive loops for receiving so that you could have that horizontal polarization and less noise. Is that what you've actually found is happening? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm using um, – actually, these are just, I mean, for 20 bucks or, you know, 15 pounds – it might, I, I'm just using loops on the ground. So I have a little 15-foot square, a little transformer. That's my small loop. And then I have a big loop going all the way around my fence, my antenna, which is uh, my antenna yard, which is 90 metres, 3, 9, 27. It's about 300 feet all the way around. Sometimes the little loop is better than the bigger loop, depending on the band, where the signal's coming from, and that sort of thing. But you're right. You see, the thing is, a vertical antenna, a well-constructed vertical antenna, transmits beautifully. And the better it is, the worse it is on receive if you're in an urban environment because, you know, little, you know, Mildred, uh, four houses away with all her fairy lights, uh, is coming, you know, <laughs> your beautifully constructed uh, vertical is actually ideally set up for that low angle reception. So it'll pick it up, but your low to the ground dipole won't pick it up because it's more interested in stuff coming in at like, you know, 20 to 30 degrees off the horizon. So, and a loop on the ground is absolutely fantastic. You, you will pick up a little bit uh, low down, but most of our 
DX is coming in from, I don't know, three, four, five degrees and up. So in fact, Mildred's fairy lights, you're not going to pick up on your loop, but you'll still hear uh, coming in at, you know, eight, eight degrees. And the thing is, with a modern radio, we don't even need an outboard preamp anymore. You can just use the preamp on the inbuilt radio and uh, and away you go. I'm getting roughly the same signal strength on my 15 foot square loop on 20 meters as I am on the vertical with the preamp off. So I have the preamp off on my left hand VFO and the preamp on on my right hand VFO. And I can track the most of the time I'm within a couple of S points of each. You know, if I'm S4 on the um, loop, I'm probably S5 or 6 on the vertical. So it's not a lot in it, really. I would recommend that if you haven't got a two VFO rig, certainly go down the um, use the receive jack that the manufacturers very often go to the trouble of putting in uh, and getting a loop on and have, then that'll automatically switch it. The investment, of course, Eric, is that you need a couple of coax lines, one for your transmit antenna and one for your receive. For the loop itself, the receive loop, you could easily use some like RG6 or 59, 70 ohm coax, which is very inexpensive and cheap and used for cable TV. That's right. I mean, I, I, I use quite good coax. I just wanted well shielded because I didn't want to pick up other bits and pieces. I mean, it's a moderate transmit coax, but yeah, I mean, re 75 ohm would be fine. Absolutely. Especially since it's been, you know, for the cable TV business, it's been made to work up to like one. 0.2 gigahertz. It's very interesting because in the area that I'm in, I'm always trying to think of the perfect antenna solution. Then, the, of course, the perfect antenna solution is at this point is one where I don't get on the roof. <laughs> yeah, okay. I have this fear of falling that I never had when I was younger. That's good to know. What do you think the greatest challenge is facing amateur radio now from your point of view? Well, it is, it is, uh, there's a couple of challenges. Uh, I think the main one is the fact that um, the RF spectrum is getting clogged up. And now I, I don't have a solution for it other than workarounds, if you know what I mean. So the workaround for me is this a very simple. Most people have got 15 feet square. Could even be in your front garden. Nobody would ever know it was there. It could be half an inch out of the ground, you know, for a receive loop. And then most most of the local crud would be then cut out. However, um the authorities responsible for the spectrum, you know, there's no real money around to have enforcement anymore. And uh, he, I was working it out in the car, actually, knowing that probably this question was going to come up. And even if everybody paid, you know, a hundred bucks a year or something, there still wouldn't be enough money to enforce enforce it, you know. So I, I don't know uh, what we do on that. But in the main, um, if you can get around your receive issue, then... You should you should be away. We should be away. I think the main real challenge, though, apart from that, I mean, and that's an obstacle, isn't it? Is at what point do you sell the idea of amateur radio in somebody's career? Because um, all the kids that I, I mean, well, we had three hundred children. It was probably I probably done. Uh, thinking day on the air or jamboree on the air to about six six to seven hundred different children i say me my team you know and uh, and that will be everything from actually getting on the radio playing with ritty um vhf uh all sorts um at what point once you've just introduced it to them do you revisit it okay is it when they're 40 years old 45 years old because the average age most people over the last 30 years have got into amateur radio were about, you know, they've had their children and they've got some extra money knocking around. I'm not saying that there's no, you know, young people in amateur radio. Of course there is. I'm just talking about the bulk now, how to bulk up the hobby. And then where do we sell this, right? Because as the future will move on with amateur radio, there'll be much more this kind of RF, come machine man interface world going on you know it's going to be quite good fun i'm sure you know we've already got you know ft8 and where you got your computer talking to a guy's computer but you're not you're still using rf you know and you so you still got to understand how it works what your coax you're using how the antenna is working what swr is and all that sort of stuff i don't know what's going to happen over the next 10 20 years but that's going to be quite interesting is the whole sort of machine thing plus rf comes together then who do you sell that to 
you know. So I've been trying to reach out to, for instance, astronomy channels to say if I could do some sort of Zoom collaboration with these guys, tell me about astronomy and I'll tell your guys about amateur radio. Maybe some of amateur radio guys would like to get into astronomy. Maybe astronomers would like to get into amateur radio. So uh, this, this, I think it's quite important that we manage to pull people that are naturally scientifically inclined. There we are, because it's a science hobby. It's not so much a social hobby. It's a science-based hobby. Where do we go for our little scientists who are probably between 40 and 50 years old that would love their eyes open to another dimension they probably don't know exists? I remember as a kid in the 60s that there was the urgent need to communicate, and that meant field phones and wires down the neighbor's back fences for your own local branch exchange in telephony or something like that. But there was this need to communicate, and that need doesn't exist anymore. Kids have cell phones, and they can communicate with themselves, perhaps to our sorrow, all the time. And as a result, there isn't that need. So I guess we have to satisfy some other need. The fact is, I think I've said this before, we live 20 years longer now than we did in the 60s and 70s as a species. And so therefore, the kids that come into amateur radio might be 35 years old. And that still gives them lots of years of operating time. What do you think about that? Well, that's amazing, isn't it? Well, I would, I would say, and I'm dovetailing this into the previous uh, uh, discussion, which is about, you know, what challenges are facing amateur radio, which can't get enough people into it, um, is that I've noticed that there's a number of people who've told me on my channel who are 70, 80 years old that are now getting into amateur radio. So I would I actually just kind of... You know, evade your question slightly and say that there's no there's no limit to age there, there really isn't but sometimes there's a limit on the amount of time people have um and the amount of money so um and that's why there's probably this sweet spot at 40 to 50 at the moment when there's enough money to be able to get into a new hobby and they've probably got enough time now, a lot of people complain, of course, that amateur radio, oh, it costs a lot of money, all this kit and everything else. But if you go and talk to a really keen fishing guy and his his gear is probably more expensive than yours, same with golfers, you know. <laughs> so everything, all hobbies, I mean, don't get into boating, will you? But all hobbies, <laughs> all hobbies cost money done well. However, I mean, you can do it on a budget. You know, there's that little, uh, is it uh, Zego G90 20 watt radio for three, four hundred, five hundred dollars, whatever, a roll of wire and a banister rail, you do what I did. So there is, there is, it, you know, it can be a, what I call a cheap hobby. You can get a second hand laptop or just use a piece of paper. I've still got my own log books, my old log books, which I originally started using when I got my first call sign because I didn't have a PC at home um, 20 years ago. We had them in the office, you know. So hopefully I kind of answered a bit of your question there, uh, Eric. You did indeed. What excites you the most? about what's happening in amateur radio now? Well, uh, some kind guy sent me some... I'm just looking at the title because I've got magazines here. Uh, QS... Oh, it's QST. Going back to 70s, 71, 66, right? And if I opened some of these and had a look at the equipment that was for sale, and, you know, your average radio, I don't know. It was six or $700, right? In those days. That was a lot of money. Now, in fairness... The beauty behind some of this gear then is that you could open up and even I could understand roughly what was going on inside, right? <laughs> uh, and some of the newer stuff is very difficult to understand what's going on inside. Software-defined radio, you know, half the time it's a computer inside a radio, you know. Uh, what excites me is that the a possibility of, you know, the price keeps coming down. It, it's got to the point where they don't really want to squash the price anymore. What they're going to do is add more features, I suppose. But the equipment, just just that kind of appliance operator stuff, right? I mean, one of the reasons, people say, why have you got a 990, which is a very big radio? Well, you know, I've got chunky big hands, and I like a lot of buttons. <laughs> I want to know that I'm, I suppose I hark back to the days in the Mediterranean when we had the most complicated-looking radio on the bridge, you know, when the captain used to press all these buttons and talk to Paul's head radio. And, uh, and I thought, you know, the more buttons it's got, the probably the better it is. And my first radio was this, uh, was an FT101ZD, you know. That was beautiful, you know, all sorts of knobs and buttons on it and so on. Yeah, just equipment, really, and 
it's that price point back to getting into the hobby and how much does it cost i'm excited that this little g90 radio and there's people breaking barriers down that you don't have to buy a thousand pound kenwood or icom or yesu and that there's there's people are chipping away and doing it a different way you know that kind of excites me in a way you can buy great equipment for low cost now comparatively speaking to the days 40 years ago yeah exactly yeah yeah definitely yeah and also i think the license structure and i think that over the next 20 20 years what excites me is i think some of these licensing structures are going to be easier to understand to get more uh, get more people on the air and and i think if i had a time machine if i could encourage like the rsgb and the arrl to find parallel science hobbies that they can they can collaborate with and i would appeal for for people to think about that because i can't do it all on my own you know what advice would you give to new or returning hams to the hobby pick a band probably 40 meters because that's easy enough to get a little piece of wire up in the back garden and practice playing amateur radio and get everything working so you know what you're doing because if you're new into amateur radio the chances are you probably don't have that much time you're probably i'm talking about that 65 70 percent of people that get into it when they're still working got a family and that sort of thing uh get on 40 meters when you can sunday afternoon whatever it is get some cq calls out and practice being amateur radio operator and get your operating skills up and i understand how to break a pile up come in at the end you know do wait for your turn all the good stuff and once you've got a band sorted move on to the next band so i would do 40 then i'd do 20 and then i'd see if i could squeeze down 80 because it's different again Callum, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. This was a lot of fun. I know this is a first for you, and I hope that you enjoyed it as well. And with that, I want to wish you uh, 73, and thank you so much. 73 all. Thank you, Eric. Bye-bye. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Callum. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in M0MCX in the search box at the top of the page. Be sure to click on the Expo menu item at the top of the page or in the show notes for updates on the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. I am updating it as I have more information. My thanks to ICOM America for its support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their banner in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any other episode into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 400. QSO Today is now available in the iHeart, Radio, Spotify, YouTube, and a bunch of other online audio services, including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use the Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who edits every single show and allows both this host and my guest to sound brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Until next time, this is Eric. 4Z1UG73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.